Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this third edition of Hydrogen Talk. We had a first one where we talked about the additionality, a second one on mobility, and this one here is on Repower EU, 20 million tons of renewable hydrogen by 2030. How can we manage this? Now, let me elaborate a little bit on what Repower EU does entail with regards to hydrogen. And uh, many of you are familiar with the IPCEIs, the Important Project of Common European Interest, and they, and that's part of the Repower EU, will all get an assessment before the end of June, uh, and um, you will have uh, uh, priority access to state aid, whoever joined there. Also, Repower EU asked for the swift adoption of the hydrogen and decarbonized gas market package and the revised RED2, which is the legislative package on the table at the moment discussed in Parliament and in Council. The Repower EU proposal says, please hurry up, uh, dear Parliament and dear Council. And then you have this division of 10 million tons of green hydrogen to be produced in Europe and another 10 million tons to be imported uh, by 2030, uh, including a so-called Mediterranean Green Hydrogen Partnership, which is basically the cooperation between Euro Europe, the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, but also uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, you have clear proposals how to convert natural gas projects uh, into renewable hydrogen projects, especially with regards to gas pipelines and LNG terminals that need, need to be retrofitted, repurposed. Then you have a very interesting proposal concerning a global European hydrogen facility, which is a double tendering of volumes that you would import to Europe. And also you have uh, a proposal for an EU-wide scheme for carbon contracts for difference, something we know from uh, the renewable technologies, the renewable energies already. We would like to discuss this uh, today with our keynote speakers. And I would like to invite as a first keynote speaker, Bernd Kupka. He is a policy officer at DG Enner with quite some uh, experience now. I think he's uh, with the commission since 2012 uh, and uh, he works since 2021 in the unit decarbonization and sustainability of energy sources in DG Energy with a focus on the promotion of renewable and low carbon fuels in the transport sector including hydrogen and hydrogen-based synthetic fuels. He also has been quite important uh, when it comes to the additionality, the principle of additionality. And I think uh, you also played quite some role uh, when it comes to the delegated act on this. But this will not be our main topic today. We want to talk about Repower EU in general. Bernd, I would like to uh, welcome you on our stage here and give you the floor. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of Hydrogen Europe for providing me with the opportunity to talk about the Repower EU plan and its implementation today. But let us also think that the, the background for this is a quite serious one. I mean, it's obviously the climate crisis where, for which we adopt the, um, um, the European Green Deal, but now, at this stage, it is obviously the, uh, the barbaric attack of Russia and Ukraine, which he really has reminded us of our energy dependency and gives this whole discussion uh, also still uh, another angle. And the Repower EU plan is there to address this matter, and it um, does so mainly on, on three axes. First of all, as an immediate measure, it aims to replenish EU gas stocks because we were short of gas and we are not yet fully sure how we uh, or whether we could really actually um, supply uh, shortages next winter. And, and this is a kind of an intermediate measure to, to address this, um, yeah, risks for energy security. First of all, it aims and will achieve to make us independent from Russian fossil fuel imports, both gas and also liquid fossil fuels. And finally, 
it is really putting an effort in the, transi in the transition of the use of fossil gases to renewable gases, both for to address climate change and as well, and importantly, to address our security of supply concerns we have currently. And in this context, uh, renewable hydrogen plays a very significant role. Um, this has been taken fully into account into the, um, in the Repower EU plan. Um, the Commission has announced that um, it, the, the ambition for renewable hydrogen has to be increased substantially, both for imported hydrogen, where we have for the first time a dedicated target of at least 10 million tons of hydrogen, as well as for the current um, ambition for domestically produced hydrogen. This is also increased um, by another 5 million tons so that the overall ambition for renewable hydrogen is raised to 20 million tons. And every one of you knows that, that this is quite a lot of hydrogen. So it's, it's ambition, but it's also necessary. And I think we need ambitious targets to, uh, to come forward on this matter. As part of the Repower EU plan, the Commission also has um, um, promoted or set out measures as part of the hydrogen accelerator. And there are four aspects to this. Firstly, we need to increase the production and the demand of hydrogen. And secondly, we need to step up and accelerate investment into hydrogen and the hydrogen value, value chain. And in order to be able to, to create a market, we also need to establish the, the required infrastructure in order to transport the hydrogen from the place where it is used to just transfer it to the place where, um, or from the place where it is produced to the places where it is, is used. And lastly, we need to ensure and to cooperate with our international partners in order not only to rely on our own yeah, resources, but also uh, on imports where hydrogen can often be produced at, at lower costs than, than in the EU. Overall, um, these measures and these targets will contribute substantially to the reduction of the um, reliance on Russian gas imports. We estimated that uh, it would reduce imports by overall 27 billion cubic meter of natural gas. And the Commission has um, proposed and established a couple of specific measures to, to complete the framework for, for hydrogen. First of all, um, these are the two delegated acts which have been published on on friday which are finalizing the regulatory framework necessary to promote hydrogen so to estimate emission savings but also to set out what actually is renewable hydrogen and how we can produce and account it towards the targets that's obviously one very important aspect then furthermore we aim to have better sources for financing and investments. So there uh, measures have been taken to front load uh, funding as part of the innovation fund, to top up the Horizon Europe investments, and also to complete assessments um, of the projects of common interest. Finally, as a, another regulatory measure in order to uh, to prop up demand for renewable hydrogen in the EU, because we know that um, that hydrogen will not be competitive, or renewable hydrogen will not be competitive with conventional hydrogen in the beginning. We have uh, proposed, not formally, but uh, we call to the co-legislators to further increase the level of ambition for renewable hydrogen uh, in the Renewable Energy Directive to uh, 75% of hydrogen consumption uh, in the industry sector 
and to 5% of energy consumption in the transport sector. And finally, and this office important, we also um, develop um, a, a mandate to set out um, the missing industry standards uh, for hydrogen production. If we talk a bit more in, in detail about the two delegated acts, which we have uh, published uh, last Friday, first of all, we have the delegated act uh, on the production criteria or the counting criteria, however you want it, for renewable hydrogen. There we think that we have tabled uh, a very balanced approach, which addresses um, the, the needs to ensure um, sustainability um, of hydrogen production to ensure that actually we achieve our policy objectives with, um, with the promotion of uh, hydrogen, but at the same time uh, establishing um, a yeah, phasing period and, um, and grandfathering, which, which promotes early investments and um, uh, allows um, yeah, the industry ad to adopt to this new framework because of we need to, well, we, everyone understand that this industry needs to be created and needs to ramp up quickly. And finally, we have um, the delegated act that sets out the emission calculation methodology, both for renewable hydrogen, but also for recycled carbon fuels. And that sets out then yeah, a harmonized way to, to estimate emission savings and to show that actually the 70% threshold of renewable hydrogen is met. Both acts um, are um, now subject to uh, public consultation for four weeks. And I can only invite you to uh, to um, yeah to have a look and also to to come forward with uh, proposals and comments for uh, further improvement if considered necessary. Um, obviously, we hope that that we have the right uh, balance here, but in particular technical uh, understanding and and from the industry is always helpful to to check and cross check um, the different provisions in in draft legislative acts. And finally, the um, um, the um, plan looks at uh, ways to improve or to find avenues for international cooperation uh, on hydrogen projects. This is essential, given that we cannot produce all the hydrogen only in Europe, uh, and this would also not be cost effective to do that. So the uh, the Commission plans to promote trade of hydrogen both within EU but also uh, to enable imports from, um, from third countries. And with regard to the import, we consider that there's, uh, there are three major import corridors. First is the Mediterranean, then we consider the, the North Sea, as well as, as well as Ukraine as the most important import corridors. However, we would look also look at other partnerships with um, other international countries, for instance, Namibia or, or, or Chile. Um, yeah, this also needs to develop further, obviously, with, with implementation of um, these yeah, uh, initiatives. And finally, uh, the uh, Repower proposes two main inst uh, instruments to facilitate this cooperation. First, these are the Green Hydrogen Partnerships. So these are political, bilateral, and multilateral partnerships, which aim to foster cooperation and incentivize decarbonization. For instance, the Southern Mediterranean partnership between Europe, Africa, and the Gulf. And here and on top of that, the global European hydrogen facility. So a platform to develop the regulatory framework for hydrogen partnerships with third countries. 
And here also we aim to boost the access of, to affordable renewable hydrogen for the member states. So I think these measures together show that um, yeah, the Commission has really an extensive and exhaustive list of initiatives to make hydrogen a reality. And um, yeah, we, we will endeavor of that and also with the support of the industry. And yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I hope that you will have a good discussion today to further elaborate on these questions. introduction. Also many thanks for putting everything into perspective and we will indeed discuss how this all is um, doable also based on the delegated act and be sure we will come back also with comments. Uh, I know that you are um, waiting for, for the comments on the delegated act um, and maybe Jakob already our next speaker uh, might refer a little bit to it um, but the task is vast, is, is, is big, and we, uh, as the hydrogen industry, have to say thank you also to the Commission um, of, you know, opening the possibilities to deliver and to accelerate with this hydrogen accelerator the path towards uh, an economy that is zero emission based on electricity, helped by a lot of hydrogen. Thanks very much. Uh, vielen Dank, uh, Bernd. And uh, I would now turn to our second keynote speaker, Jakob Krogsgaard, who is the CEO of Everfuel, and he's also the spokesperson of our production working group. So we have basically a working group that is dealing with the possibilities uh, to produce. Um, Everfuel, uh, Jakob himself is the founder of Everfuel, uh, and uh, he has uh, quite some experience in the hydrogen sector uh, already before. Uh, in Scandinavia mainly, but not only. Everfuel is making... Uh, ah, okay, I can see that uh, Jakob will join later. Uh, so he will give his keynote uh, later because of technical issues. Then we turn directly to our panel. Uh, and um, uh, I'm in the very, very lucky position to announce to you um, a gender unbalanced panel uh, with ladies only. So we have on our panel uh, Wiebeke Rasmussen. Um, she is the Senior Vice President Product Management and Certification at Yara Clean Ammonia. Uh, I think the biggest producer of fertilizers in the world. Uh, we uh, will have uh, uh, Anne Kurz. She is the Program Manager uh, External Affairs of one of the main entry points of hydrogen, but also production points, the port of Rotterdam. And we have uh, Valeria Palmisano from uh, SNAM. She is running the institutional relations for SNAM. Very important uh, because of uh, the uh, pipeline and the infrastructure connection. And we will also welcome Eva Henning from uh, Tuga. She is the head of the Brussels office uh, of Tuga and a very uh, clear voice uh, of uh, the heating sector and of uh, DSOs. Let me start with uh, Wiebeke. Uh, she has been with Yara since 2014, uh, working with R&D uh, and with uh, environmental technologies. Um, and uh, prior to joining the newly developed Yara Clean Ammonia Unit, um, she uh, was uh, in the management, she had management positions within the water and wastewater industry. So, Wiebeke, you know very, very well this biggest customer of hydrogen globally, which is the fertilizer industry. Uh, and also in Repower EU, industry as uptaker plays quite an important role. So, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the, the production of fertilizers but also petrochemical industry and steel industry. And of course, the chemical industry are closely related to it. Um, do you think you can be an uptaker of big, big volumes of this 20 million tons? Because we always need to overcome the chicken and egg problem. Who, after hydrogen has been produced, uses the hydrogen? 
what is your take on that? Vivek, you have the floor. Yes, uh, I think today the uh, fertilizer industry is is actually producing about 180, 85 million tons of ammonia. And that actually amounts to about 45 percent of or based on 45 percent of the hydrogen that is produced today in the world. Uh, Europe is producing about well, 9 to 10 percent share of the global nitrogen fertilizer production. Uh, we as Yara, is, uh, we are actually the second largest world producer of uh, ammonia, but we are the largest trader. So we have a capacity of 8.5 or 8.6 million tons across 17 different units worldwide. And out of this, it's around 4, 4.2, I think is the exact number for that goes into Europe uh, of ammonia. So, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, today it's produced based on, on SMR technology and, and gas, natural gas. Uh, but we are looking, of course, to turn this into electrolysis and green ammonia. And we have pilots that are under construction uh, to look into this um, green ammonia production. Um, saying that, it's also green ammonia or production from electrolyzers is not really new to Yara. This was how Norsh Kidro uh, started back in the 1920s. And we actually had electrolyzers in our Norway Glomford plant up until 1989. That's interesting. Yeah? So history comes back. Um, indeed, uh, Norway has been uh, one of the first, if not the first country to use electrolysis. And uh, you mentioned it in your history. It already played an important role. And uh, it's, it's good to see um, the chairman of uh, Hydrogen Europe is a Norwegian and represents a Norwegian electrolyzer company. Um, it's, it's good to see that it now comes back, but on an industrial scale. I uh, would like to inform you that uh, together with uh, the European Commission under the umbrella of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, we could uh, kick off uh, something which will emerge to a, an electrolyzer partnership, European electrolyzer partnership, in order uh, to ramp up this industry. Um, but how does this ammonia, which is regarded as a, as a carrier for green hydrogen, at least in the transition time when the pipelines are not ready, how will this ammonia come to us? And here the ports play a role. So I would like to bring Anne Kurz in uh, into the discussion uh, and to discuss um, the possibilities of accepting uh, this ammonia. So what's the role of ports in this context, um, in the initial phase and possibly also uh, in the time after? We have seen that the port of Rotterdam has been awarded uh, for not for the first time as uh, one of the most important ports when it comes to hydrogen. Um, how would you um, comment this 20 million tons and what's basically uh, the role that the port of Rotterdam will play in this context? Anne, you can unmute yourself and then. Yeah. Thank you, Yorgo. Sorry to uh, for, I forgot to unmute. Um, yes, we are actually at this moment already playing a role in the import of ammonia and the storage. So for the coming years, um, we are ready uh, for hydrogen in many forms and uh, in many carriers. But we are obviously preparing for the large volumes that we are expecting especially now the European ambitions have, um, uh, have uh, risen. Um, I can um, explain a bit on the base of this, uh, this picture, how we are as a port preparing for these large volumes and how we are building the um, hydrogen economy basically along the uh, entire value chain. So um, for production, for example, we are developing a two gigawatt electrolyzer park on the mass flakte, 
you already mentioned this, uh, Jorgo. So we are focusing on production uh, for the industrial cluster uh, within Rotterdam itself. But also, obviously, the port has an important role in uh, transporting the hydrogen towards uh, the rest of Europe. So for imports, we have signed agreements with many international regions and countries on behalf of our national government. Uh, and on top of existing terminals and other facilities, uh, the port companies are building new terminals because we see that this volume obviously requires new terminals. We, yes, we can use the existing, but we need also to develop new uh, facilities. And so in terms of infrastructure, we are preparing a new pipeline within the Rotterdam cluster to provide clients, industrial clients, with a high quality level of hydrogen. Um, yes, there's also the option, and we are as, as a country, uh, together with Cassini, exploring how all the existing pipelines can be used but we as a port also see that new infrastructure and pipelines are needed. For example, with the Delta Corridor project, which contains a bundle of pipelines for several products, among which hydrogen, and that Delta Corridor will connect Rotterdam with Camelot um, in Limburg, the industrial area there, and the industry of North Rhine-Westphalia because there are many uh, products needed and, and possibly also the capture of uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Um, then finally, to stimulate demand, we also have some relevant projects going on. We are connecting industrial partners uh, for the hydrogen need, like the refineries. And then we have projects for the demand <coughs> within mobility. In, uh, for example, the Rhine project, together with the province of South Holland and many other partners, a corridor for inland shipping run on hydrogen is developed. And there's also the Hytrex project, which focuses on the heavy transport towards Belgium. Um, so here, yes, the, these are all re relevant projects to stimulate demand. And we look forward to all the other European, to connect with all the other European initiatives that there are. So to sum things up, we are ready to accommodate um, the flows in the coming years of import. And we are preparing for the future, for the larger flows, which are symbolized by this um, yellow graph. Um, you can see it, it rises quickly. It's quite amazing to see that graph. Uh, it's a nearly exponential growth there. And uh, indeed, uh, Rotterdam, which is port number one, I think, in, in Europe, um, biggest port, 10th biggest in the world, uh, will play a role here. Uh, Anna, we, we have a plan because the European Hydrogen Strategy says that Hydrogen as a commodity, uh, which it will be in, in quite some time, latest 2030, uh, needs, uh, first of all, uh, a currency to be denominated in, to be paid in. And the European Hydrogen Strategy says this should be the euro and not any other currency. And I think it's a good idea. But it needs also a marketplace. And uh, we think that Rotterdam might be an interesting place where basically the price making mechanism takes place on a global level so uh, to host the global marketplace on hydrogen in europe would be would be good but i'll come back to it and especially uh, to you and uh, also to Wiebeke uh, with a question on ammonia because ammonia seems to be the most popular carrier in the transition time so in between but i have some questions on safety there and how we can uh, deal with it but that's in the second round, also after having our keynote speaker. Uh, let me turn to Valeria. Uh, Valeria Palmisano, uh, head of institutional relations with uh, the EU, uh, for some uh, in Brussels. Uh, you have also a more than 10-year experience uh, in, in that sector, Valeria. 
And we now heard about the, the, port, the important hub terminals. Um, what about pipeline systems? What about the direct connection um, in Europe? So to bring these hubs and uh, possibly big projects together, because we know, uh, we repeatedly said that pipeline is the cheapest way to transport hydrogen. But also, Bernd mentioned in his initial um, speech, the, the role of Northern Africa, the role of Africa as a partner. And some is running with partners, pipelines, uh, many pipelines to Northern Africa. So when can we expect this to be retrofitted, repurposed to become a reality? Valeria, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgen. Thank you all for, uh, for joining and listening. Uh, first, a few numbers perhaps about SNAP because you mentioned pipelines and indeed as a player in Europe we have the, uh, the most visible uh, numbers uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, more than 40,000 kilometers of pipeline, uh, important figures in terms of gas storage, which is uh, quite of a uh, topic in the spotlight these days, around uh, 17 BCM. Uh, and some 20 BCM of uh, regasification capacity. Um, infrastructure is already there. Uh, it's, there's a lot of talk uh, about scaling up the hydrogen market. Um, it's a big challenge because, as you said, and as it was said before, the Commission is uh, increasing a lot the ambition on the production and on the volumes that need to be imported. Uh, the good news is that, to some extent, uh, the basis and the core of, of the infrastructure in a vision uh, where hydrogen will be transported in the most cost-efficient cost way uh, is there. Um, and if I look at the rationale of all the most recent uh, initiatives of the Commission, uh, leave aside for a moment Repower U, which is the latest, but already the TENI in December 2020, uh, it was envisaging a uh, room for reconverting infrastructures uh, from gas, and this has been confirmed in the final agreement. And this is what we will see in the text that will be, will be in the official journal. Um, if I look at the, at the gas package, the way it was presented by the Commission, uh, the rationale there is to support the case for pipelines as being the most uh, cost-effective way and let's not forget that in the current circumstances, uh, the topic of cost uh, becomes more and more important. Um, of course, uh, as now we're participating in several initiatives, uh, pipelines of projects under the National Recovery Plan, of course, uh, but the most visible one, uh, for instance, would be uh, the hydrogen backbone. It's a concept that is already known in the, in the, in the environment. 7th of June, uh, no spoiler, uh, but there will be a relaunch and representation of this, uh, of this vision, which has been developed by 31 TSOs now um, in Europe uh, to create uh, an infrastructure uh, catering for what you were mentioning before, a real interconnected market for hydrogen uh, in the belief that the scattered model, um, let me say, uh, that will have to find space where it's needed because we cannot use one model as a blueprint for all the industrial needs and all the consumers' needs, that is for sure. But by developing a system that enables cross-border flows of hydrogen, we can certainly pave the way for these ambition visions that you were mentioning, including the fact of having hydrogen apps with transactions that are indexed in euro. And this is something that we have seen quite visibly in the latest documents of the of the Repower U. Um, in the backbone, the five corridors that have been uh, designed remain coherent with the three core uh, corridors uh, that the Commission has identified in the Repower U. Italy, of course, as, uh, is gifted with, her, with, with its geography. Uh, this is a matter of fact because we already have uh, the highest, perhaps, level of diversification in terms of supplies. Um, we have a natural interface with North Africa, with connections that are already there, uh, with a region that is gifted for the production of renewable hydrogen. Um, again, with cost profiles that remain quite interesting compared to what we can achieve in Europe. So 
um, without, uh, let me say, falling in the fears because we are catching this uh, sometimes in the political debate of creating new dependencies uh, because uh, let's not forget that these types of cooperation pay also in terms of uh, general stability for these countries that remain quite important also to us. Um, let me say this vision, uh, we're quite happy to see that the Commission uh, is continuing on this line. Uh, the new uh, reference uh, to relaunch the energy diplomacy at European level go in this direction. And this is extremely important because there's a lot of talk about Ukraine, but let's not forget that there are other regions uh, south that keep deserving attention. Um, so all in all, if I, if I look at what we had already before uh, the Repower U, uh, the, 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 the path was already traced, uh, favoring a vision where gas infrastructures in a cost efficient way uh, can serve this purpose and accompany uh, this transition uh, without uh, leapfrogs or quantum leaps or uh, uh, creating gaps, uh, thus creating also the conditions for the industry to adapt to the new vectors. Many thanks, uh, Valeria. Indeed, um, your Prime Minister uh, Mario Draghi has uh, recently visited uh, Algeria and uh, he did not only talk about gas, he did also talk about gas, like all governments do at the moment, but he also talked about uh, the hydrogen readiness and uh, this, is, uh, this is a very good sign and uh, you're absolutely right. There's not yeah, only the big Eastern partner, uh, Ukraine, there's also uh, at least Algeria as one important partner, but you wanted to add something. Yeah, all infrastructures in perspective will have to be hydrogen ready. And this was something that we thought quite clearly uh, from the taxonomy. I go back to the 10E, uh, but let me say if the future has to be decarbonized, uh, this is a profile of infrastructure that needs to be uh, needs to be ensured. And the good news is that uh, the operators like us, like all the other TSOs uh, that I mentioned, have luckily all the skills and the expertise. Uh, we always mention, you know, the funding, the financial capital. Let's not forget that the human capital here is extremely important. So cultivating the competencies and uh, having decisions taken and actions taken where the competencies are remain extremely important. Let me then turn to one expert. Um, so um, our second keynote speech. Um, so we. Um, have a little bit of a break of this panel and of course continue later on uh, to listen to Jakob the uh, Coast Guard. Uh, Jakob, I, I did already talk about your Vita, your bio uh, uh, and um, I would like to invite you to give your intervention right now. You are the founder of Everfuel uh, which is making green hydrogen for zero emission mobility commercially available across Europe. Um, and uh, you are for many, many years in the field, and now you're running an all-inclusive hydrogen supply and, and fueling solution system. Um, please, we are um, happy to welcome you here on, in our hydrogen talk. You have the, you have the floor for our keynote. Perfect. And thank you so much, Yoko, and, and apologies for uh, earlier. 20 seconds before uh, I was supposed to go online, we had a... Uh, we had a fire alarm here in the building, but uh, it seems like it's uh, uh, no worries. So all thank you for, for listening in and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come with a, with a keynote here talking about the importance and the consequences of a Repower EU, uh, not just for us in fuel, but for hydrogen as a whole. Next slide, please. I have uh, I've worked with, uh, with hydrogen uh, for, uh, for 20 years now. So it's, a, it's truly a, a pleasure to see hydrogen moving from just being a, a constant of a future potential to being a, a truly significant and important and fundamental part of the, the energy mixed in energy structure of, of Europe going ahead. So energy has now moved to become a security policy uh, as well. The, uh, uh, the announcement of a Repower EU, I think on, on behalf of our industry, we can only uh, applause this. This comes in a, in, a perfect, uh, in a perfect synchronization with the announcement of the 150 gigawatts of offshore wind power in the North Sea by the, the Danish, German, Dutch and the Belgian uh, governments. This is, a, this is truly uh, significant and important. This combined with the 
and the European electrolyzer manufacturers that have jointly uh, stood up and said, well, we're ready to increase capacity to produce 20 gigawatts of electrolyzers per year already from 2025. So it's, uh, it's truly happening. One of, the, uh, one of the concerns we might have when now actually implementing hydrogen in reality are uh, the facts about uh, the not in my backyard mentality. We, uh, we have seen this on, on hydrogen stations that we have installed throughout Europe. Uh, we are seeing this on some of the concerns when it comes to electrolyzers, and we have seen that definitely when it comes to renewable energy. We need to move this into a yes in my backyard mentality, because if we can't see the green transition here in Europe, the green transition is uh, not happening fast enough. Um, I think it's also uh, with, a, with a great pleasure that we see the, the power to X ambitions that we are now uh, are hearing about throughout Europe, also uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam. Same goes for, for what we do here in Denmark. We've been leading the momentum within wind development, uh, and now we're trying to do the exact same on, uh, on the power to X. It's, uh, it's vital and critical that we move forward and we do that quickly. Next slide, please. So um, now we need to uh, now we need actions to uh, to truly move ahead. We uh, we also have laws the uh, the delegated acts coming out here on Friday. Now it's a matter of getting them implemented, getting the the rules or the new rules of the game fixed, and uh, and then we also need to come up with a uh, uh, with a tool that where where we can handle the certificates uh, training. So uh, uh, now we've just been talking about what is the, the methodology and what are the rules uh, uh, that go on regarding green hydrogen. Well, how do we then actually use this in reality? This is, a, uh, this is needed, potentially even a short-term uh, quick fix solution that can bridge to until the right solution. Um, it's also uh, fundamental that uh, politicians, etc., throughout Europe recognize that that's not just one solution that can, uh, that can fix the, the climate challenges. Uh, hydrogen and especially electrolyzers are definitely one of these core uh, technologies uh, that are needed. And uh, it seems like we in our industry are, uh, are now finally getting the, the recognition that we need. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. So when, uh, when that is set, we are getting the recognition we also have some homework to do in our industry. So we need to make sure that the hydrogen technologies that we will be building with a tremendous speed and scale throughout Europe, they need to be robust, they need to be scalable. There are different electrolyzer technologies and with very different maturity levels, and we need to recognize that they are not uh, all ready at the same time. We need to promise ourselves in our industry not to not to run too much ahead of ourselves and forget about quality and worst case safety. That we, we should never uh, we should never doubt that. Then it's a matter of working against uh, standardization of electrolyzers across suppliers. This will definitely also help when talking about the balance of plants. So all of the system that goes around the electrolyzers. So when such standardization are in place it will have really good effects when it comes to uh, the supply of the balance of planks parts, uh, as well as the, uh, the pricing. We have seen this uh, in a very good development uh, as an example from so long. Then uh, for the mobility sector, we're truly lacking uh, vehicles. And that's throughout the sectors. It's trucks, it's buses, it's vans, it's car. Some of these are available on the car side. We need much more, we need a rarity, and we need them with a very fast speed. Next slide, please. So uh, the uh, Repower EU and uh, connecting this with the, uh, the Fit for 55 uh, targets. It's, uh, it's clearly within mobility that uh, setting up uh, hiding stations across Europe gives the first mover advantage and definitely also a first mover disadvantage and risk. Uh, and that risk is multiplied with the maturity level of, uh, of hiding stations. So we really need to constantly push in our industry to get that maturity level 
to uh, to an even higher level. When we are talking on uh, on industry, uh, the the carbon contracts for difference are a huge chance to to substitute substitute the uh, the fossil based uh, feedstock, mainly uh, natural gas. And uh, maybe the unfortunate events in Ukraine is actually the opportunity that we in our industry have been waiting for. Um, it's also important that we that we mitigate uh, the factor and uh, uh, that we mitigate the risks in the high fluctuations we will see in the power process. And uh, we can, to to some extent, handle that by uh, by building and directly uh, connecting renewable assets with electrolyzers. But we do need electrolyzers to be grid connected uh, as well. Then it's all a matter of our industry turning from making just R&D projects into truly making this into a, a very rapid growing industry. Uh, that requires a, a mindset change uh, in many different locations. We should not forget about R&D. We need to continue to do that. But the commercial side of our industry really needs to, uh, to step up now. Uh, let's like this. So uh, summing this up, the hydrogen ambition so where are, where are we in, uh, in 2030 in Europe? Well, we are uh, on a significant different path than where we are now. Hopefully, we will have implemented what, uh, what the Repower EU is all about, what Fit for 55 is all about. We will have hydrogen at uh, significant and large scales uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we will be hopefully completely independent on, uh, on Russian gas and that being replaced by a mixture of uh, green hydrogen produced in Europe and imported green hydrogen. Then uh, while we are uh, getting all of the, the pipelines ready for the hydrogen backbones of Europe, in the meantime, creating sustainable hubs, we call these our way fuel hydrogen hubs or the hydrogen valleys, where we have ecosystems that without, uh, without uh, pipeline connections uh, to the mainland Europe, we will be able to make a good business case. When each of these are good business cases, then they will be connected with pipelines, and then hopefully that will make each of those businesses even better. So uh, then last thing, we see scaling uh, hydrogen production for industry and mobility to do that in, uh, in a perfect harmony. Mobility has the limitation that we start with a low offtake and then that increases while industry can replace significant quantities now, but it has to be at the right price point. So those two offtake mechanisms uh, will be uh, will be complementing each other really well, and we hope to see that grow tremendously. Last slide, please. So uh, thank you so much for, for listening in, and apologies for uh, changing the structure of, uh, of the presentations, uh, Jorgo. Uh, nevertheless, uh, appreciate the time, and uh, Thank you so much for joining. Tschüss, guten Tag. Many thanks, uh, Jakob. Uh, I think it's very, very good to see uh, how also you as participant in the mobility sector can contribute to uptaking. As you said, in the beginning it's lower, but there are also clear targets in uh, Repower EU uh, that go up to 5% of all fuels in 2030 need to be based on hydrogen. Uh, so based on hydrogen, not all of this will be hydrogen, but 5% of all fuels, that's quite an interesting target. Thanks to you uh, and um, Thank you. Big, big, big success I wish uh, to you and uh, your company because uh, you are well needed uh, because AFIR, the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Regulation, which is ongoing, um, needs a lot of uh, hydrogen refueling stations that you will construct, build and deliver. And I wish you good luck and us good luck. I'm a proud driver of a hydrogen car, so I know exactly that I could need some more. Uh, thanks very much. So, thank you. Thank you. I would now like to turn to Eva Henning. Uh, and Eva represents uh, more than, well, uh, since 89 already, uh, Tuga AG in Munich, uh, concentrating very much on the distribution system operator job, so DSOs, and um, this is another part which could be a big uptaker. So the DSOs with uh, all their expertise in um, uh, heating uh, and not only, also power production on a, on a municipal, on a local level. Um, IFA is a very um, 
clear and hearable voice in Brussels. <laughs> and uh, I would like to know how ready are the DSOs for hydrogen and are they also ready to take some of the 20 million tons that we need to produce until 2030? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, uh, I've been with Trigo now for 32 years, so it's quite some time. <clears throat> Um, yes, I will represent uh, Tuga, which is a group of 100 utility companies in Germany, and uh, I'm heading our Brussels office, and I'm also part of Hydrogen Europe, uh, but also of, of the overall gas world. And uh, yes, we are ready to roll, you, would, you could say. Uh, and th this is not new for us. So we are very lucky that not only within Tuga, but also within other companies, we have started a long time ago. Uh, so the first electrolyzer that was connected to a distribution grid in Tuga was in uh, 2013 already. Um, and since then, we've been working on this topic. And so my takeaway from, from what's happening at the moment is uh, we are lucky that um, we already started working so early because now we, we see a huge wave coming over us. And the huge wave will come from the acceleration of the hydrogen backbone. You can already see this with, with those many projects. So every week something big is announced. Uh, just give you one example. We have the Hercules project in Germany, where many, many, many distribution companies are connected uh, in that area. So the question is now, okay, how far are you? So we are getting the questions uh, as DSOs, when will you be ready to accept hydrogen? And this is what I would like to talk about. So what are we doing? Um, first of all, we have a, a German project, which is called H2 Fort, um, which is to do the transition planning. And this is something that we're used to do because we already did the transition from town gas uh, to uh, natural gas, not as long ago as the other ones. We did this in the 90s when we had, uh, when Germany was reunited. I was already there at that time. So I, I, I know what happens if you do something like this. It's not an easy project, but you can do it if you have the knowledge. And now we have the ongoing switch from HL gas to H gas. So it's a it's something that we know how it works. And this is why the DSOs got together and we have this huge project and we published our first plan, which is like a cookbook. It's supposed to, to give the DSOs the practical, um, the tools, how to start working. So what do you have to assess? Um, when do you start talking to the customers? Which customers are the first ones? So, of course, you start talking to your anchor customers, to your big ones, because they are also the ones when you look at, at Repower EU, but also when you look at Fit for 55. Um, the industry cannot go to 100% of electricity. We just had a presentation by the glass industry one hour ago. They said, no, it's going to be hybrids, which means that we have, um, maybe this is a specialty, in Germany, 99% of all the industrial consumers are connected to the distribution grids. It's 1.8 million customers. This is not even the normal, typical German uh, Mittelstand. Um, the biggest ones are really huge. We're talking about glass, metals. So this means that if we want to decarbonize the industry, we have to do this in the distribution grid. So this is the cook. We also have the same thing at the European level. It's called Ready for H2. It's a pan-European project. We have uh, 92 companies at the distribution level involved in 19 countries. So it's spreading from Portugal to the Ukraine, from Israel going up to the north of, of Sweden. And we are doing a very similar thing. It's a lot about information sharing, but it's also we have now a roadmap. And the roadmap means that everybody who is part of a Ready for H2 is working concretely in his grids to say, OK, what what do we have to do to get hydrogen ready? And within Ready for H2, we came to the conclusion that the grids in the ground, meaning the pipes which are in the grounds and the fittings and everything there, is more than 90% hydrogen ready already today because most of the materials are normal steel, are normal polyethylene, so we don't have to exchange them. I don't care whether I have to exchange a meter. The meter is easy to exchange. I would care if I have to dig out a pipe. That's a different thing. So for us, converting to 100% of hydrogen is a lot easier probably than for the TSOs because they, are, they, have, op they have been operating different kinds of pipes. And the last point is when we connect the production, the local production of hydrogen to the customers. And long before the hydrogen backbone is in all those areas, because we will see local hydrogen production where we have the wind farms and where we have the PV farms. And we have to make sure that they have an outlet. 
that they can bring their hydrogen to the market. And most people say, well, if it's in the DSO world, it's not in the market. That's nonsense. In Germany, we have had biomethane in the market forever. It's just a matter of how you make the rules. So we want to connect everybody, no matter where they are, to our grid with hydrogen and biomethane to make sure that we include those molecules and bring them to the market and bring them to the customers, have the small hydrogen valleys and make sure that we can start with the conversion. Uh, many thanks for this insight. Um, and I would like to uh, bring everybody in, but uh, uh, but I would like to stick to your point right now. Uh, Eva, you say you are hydrogen ready and you described why from the historical and the technological background and the material background, this is the this is uh, the case. However, there are rumors that, especially in the country you know best, uh, there is a plan, a government plan, to abolish this infrastructure and to concentrate on electricity only. I, I think this is important to discuss because uh, we are now in a, in, a, in a situation where the 20 million tons need to come into the system but there are people who are saying oh just industry even the mobility sector uh, is limited in the view of some so how come that in, in your government has these kind of plans how do you react and is that realistic what uh, what we hear from germany here if you want to if is not frozen i think We come back to that question later on uh, because uh, it's it's amazing. If you're back, no, okay. Then I would like to turn to the ammonia question that we discussed uh, in the beginning uh, with, uh, especially with Wiebeke, uh, with Anne, but also uh, ask Valeria later on if ammonia pipelines might be might be uh, also an option. Um, so ammonia, how safe is this, uh, Wiebeke? I would uh, like to uh, ask both of you, Anna and Wiebeke, how safe is this? Uh, because there are so many people warning that it's hazardous, that it's dangerous, and we should not rely on ammonia uh, as a, uh, a fuel or uh, as, a, a, well, something that we transport over oceans. Wiebeke, what's your experience with ammonia here? Well, I think ammonia is transported already today worldwide, uh, both in pipelines via rail trains and, and in ships. So I think it's, uh, it's, it, we have experience, uh, although safety always needs to be taken seriously and you need to ensure that you have qualified people handling it and that you are training people on the safety. Um, From, from our point of view, I, don't, I see there are issues with safety with hydrogen as much as with ammonia, and those needs to be taken seriously, of course. But we have handled ammonia for 100 years. I would add as much as with oil and gas, because there are also uh, issues and we handle it and uh, it normally uh, goes well. Um, I stay uh, with, uh, on this question and come to Anne. Uh, what, what's your experience with ammonia? Are you planning to enlarge the ammonia capacity uh, in order to uh, be a bigger hub here? Y yes, we are, in short, uh, Jorgo. Uh, but fully agree with um, with Wiebeke. Um, you need to... The, so governments, policymakers um, who are looking at these larger amounts need to really work with the experienced companies and partners who have been doing this for many, many years, uh, like in Rotterdam, but also in other areas. Uh, ammonia is already being stored, it's already being transported, and obviously any type of um, uh, specific product uh, needs um, a good risk al analysis, needs a thorough um, safety check and experienced working people. Um, and now we are seeing the uh, increase in amounts. Uh, obviously, we are already starting a, a dialogue with stakeholders, uh, with, uh, with part, concerned parties all uh, around the ports who are wondering, you know, what, what will happen and, and how could this affect me? Um, 
So there's the aspect of uh, terminals and storage, but then there's also the aspect of transport, like was already mentioned. And there, um, you as a, as a policymaker, you could consider both. Uh, so uh, buy ships and trucks, and again, work with the experienced partners, but also consider transport through pipelines on the ground. Uh, pipelines on the ground, ammonia, Valeria, have you heard of any plans of going to ammonia pipelines? They do exist, but are there any any bigger plans uh, when it comes to the TSOs running the pipeline system in Europe? Look, should there be a demand uh, and should there be a request? Um, I will not exclude, as it has been said already, uh, that there are the skills and the expertise to, to manage also that. Uh, from the safety point of view and from the technical aspects. Uh, indeed, it's a vector that has different characteristics hmm, uh, compared to hydrogen. Uh, there are perspectives also, you know, in terms of uh, liquid form. So um, it's, it's an option. Again, uh, in this phase, with the numbers we have in mind and the surrounding circumstances that is worth keeping in mind, uh, the best is to keep a uh, pragmatic ambition. Mm. So remain uh, with the long-term perspective, uh, but also with the pragmatic attitude, uh, because this will make sure that we have steps uh, that are concrete uh, in a direction uh, that is uh, certain. I like this word, word pragmatic attitude, because uh, we hear a lot of policymakers concentrating on certain technologies only. Sometimes it even favors hydrogen. So I hear a lot uh, of talk about LNG hubs to be repurposed to liquid hydrogen hubs, which is techni technically quite challenging, to be honest. Um, and the pragmatic approach, um, maybe Anna can, uh, can say a few words on that, is to focus on different possibilities uh, to let hydrogen land uh, if imported in Europe. Uh, th there is also LOHC, uh, there is also the, the liquid hydrogen. So uh, I think this is an option that the Port of Rotterdam especially is looking into, correct? Yes, correct, uh, Jorgo. We are um, uh, carefully studying with partners, with companies, all uh, types of carriers and are um, in, in close contact with all existing terminals um, how these different types of carriers could be uh, stored in a larger volume uh, because of the simple fact that we need to have we need to see this uh, economy grow and need, need to see where the market will um, will uh, what what choices of the market will be so that's why we are preparing uh, for for all of those and and Every carrier has its own characteristics, has its own requirements. So um, uh, some take more volume in storage, others uh, like um, liquid hydrogen is uh, very complex to, to, uh, to, to transport because it needs to be, um, uh, it needs to be uh, very much below below zero, uh, 200 degrees, uh, if I'm not mistaken. 252. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we are, for the Port of Rotterdam, very much focusing on all of the options at this moment. Excellent. I turn now to uh, Eva again to come back to the question on why German policymakers have this plan to abolish the existing infrastructure uh, for hydrogen later on and to concentrate only on electrons. And, but I would announce to uh, uh, the panel already that in the second round now, I would like to discuss which bottlenecks remain. Although we have now Repower EU, although we have now the hydrogen accelerator, what do you still need in order to start tomorrow? But if I, um, you were about to explain how ready you are, and now uh, there, there is this plan from Berlin uh, cutting you off. 
Uh, wh where's the logic? I, I don't get the point. Does, should not everybody have the right to hydrogen, every sector, and in the end, everybody, like the right to electricity? What's, what's your comment? Sorry, first for my glitch in the internet. Um, yes, there are certain members of our ministries who are still convinced that electricity is the only way to go. The big difference is that we are operating in Tuga electricity grids and district heating grids and gas grids. So we have a very good idea what is possible and what is not possible. And the worst thing that can happen to us on the electricity sector is to connect unrenovated homes to install electric heat pumps then and then having a cold winter. We had a cold winter two years ago with minus 16 degrees here in Munich, which would mean that if you have a house like this, you suddenly have two of those heating sticks, which each of them eight kilowatt and our whole electricity grid, grid is then going down. So what, what we think is we have to make the best of everything that we have as an infrastructure. Infrastructure has a huge value. I'm sure that Valeria has the same opinion. It is already in the ground. You don't have to get it in there. It is there. It's the same with the ports. Um, so we have to make sure that we make the best use of it and saying, well, to the DSOs, you can forget about everything that you have in the ground means also, well, we're going to disconnect all those 15 million gas customers if they want or if they don't want. So those are the kind of messages that we hear. And this is why there was a big backslash also from the industry uh, widely uh, to say, well, this is not the right way to go because we don't even know where we want to go. So saying electricity is the only way might be the opinion of some, but it has never been proven technically that this is possible, that we have the grids for it at the distribution level or at the TSO level, or that the customers are able to do this. So if you ask me what is our biggest threshold aside from those political discussions, which are really harmful, because you you are, what, what are you doing? You're ruining money that's if, if we would all be at the at the uh, at the exchange we would have lost a lot of money with those kind of sentences but not to be deterred by, by that discussion what is the biggest um hurdle i would say it's the fight it's the more dogmatic fight about where is hydrogen allowed to go and still the discussion of hydrogen is the champagne which has been proven so many times now that hydrogen will not be the champagne there will be enough hydrogen uh, but that the belief that you have five industrial clusters on which you're going to build the whole hydrogen economy from a country or from several countries just does not make sense because you make yourself dependent just on one or two or three industrial consumers, which might be not at speed at that moment when you need them. So to be more pragmatic and have a broader view on this and say, OK, if we get the hydrogen and if the hydrogen has the right price and goes in the same direction, and uh, this is important. And the second one is to understand that the hydrogen backbone development depends on the DSOs. Because if every DSO is connected to the hydrogen backbone, you cannot speed up the development of the backbone. You have to convert them in parallel. If you want to get rid of the natural gas in the grid, even blending helps. I know you're, good, you're not always on the same side with me when you talk about blending, but 20% of blending means a reduction of 7% energy from the Russians. So it is a good way to start and it's the best way to connect. So this dogmatic discussion outside of any technical reality uh, is really, for me, I think the biggest struggle. It's not the technical issues that we have in the grids. They can all be solved. That's just a matter of work and engineering and a, a little bit of uh, struggling where is everything. It's not the technical things that is really worrying me. It's the dogmatic. Very interesting. Uh, I share this view, by the way that uh, uh, ideology, dogma dogmatism instead of pragmatism is the issue here. Uh, and I'll come back uh, basically uh, for the last round uh, to that, may maybe then uh, commenting on the delegated act. But I would like to invite uh, Valeria to uh, also being uh, in infrastructure uh, and to comment uh, possibly on, on that um, with regards to um, blending. Uh, I'm, I'm not against uh, Eva. Uh, at least for a transition. I think this is the position that within our association uh, becomes a stable position that uh, for a quick solution and a quick win, and you mentioned the figures, 7% seven, 7 is not nothing. It's quite uh, a lot even uh, to reduce uh, emissions. This is a way to go. And I know that uh, SNAM uh, goes also for a transition to that di direction. Correct, Valeria? Yes, you're correct. And this is something we have tested uh, already, both for uh, pipelines and for, for the storages. But 
Um, what we see now, it's of course a, a big divide in Europe on this topic, and we expect it to be one of the most divisive uh, debates in the gas package. We know already that uh, Eva is a <laughs> hi, Eva. <laughs> good to see you again. <laughs> Has already quoted the numbers, um, the threshold that we have of uh, five percent uh, suggested in the gas package. It's already uh, a value uh, that can help at least giving a message uh, at its connection points. Mm. Uh, but there again, uh, it all goes back to uh, the technical aspects. And, and if we bring the discussion back to the technical aspects and we uh, set aside for a moment the, the political pools, uh, then I believe the discussion can become uh, more simple than that. If I talked about champagne, uh, we like champagne, nobody is against it, but um, it's true that it harms um, always telling people that hydrogen is the champagne and it's so expensive. Um, I would like to bring Wiebeke in uh, with regards to that price, because basically you as the biggest hydrogen customer in the world so far um, will need to pay possibly for a transition period, <clears throat> a higher price <clears throat> for green instead of gray hydrogen uh, to, to stick to the color code. Although at the moment, I would even doubt that. We have some calculations um, saying, telling us that in the north of Norway, where you have still a lot of untapped hydropower capacities that cannot be transported elect as uh, electricity because the grid is not there, uh, but you could use uh, of course, hydrogen pipelines to do that, plus um, the uh, wind, the possible wind harvesting uh, in the north of Norway, you could bring down the cost, interestingly, our figures show, to 80 cent, euro cent per kilo already now. So it's it's even cheaper than grey. But honestly, I would, I would like to know how you at Yara are discussing that price issue and whether you see an issue with renewable energy uh, resources because that's the other part of the deal. Uh, Repower EU is a lot about hydrogen, but a lot more about renewable energy resources that need to be built up. Uh, what's, what's your expectation here as one of the biggest customers in the world? Yeah, and I, th I think if we start with the renewable energy, of course, it's, it's for, for ammonia plants. We're talking also gigawatt. Uh, there are huge, huge production plants. So, of course, renewable energy is needed at scale to produce areas in the world which are more favorable on renewable energies. And there are, of course, a lot of different hydrogen at a much lower price than, than first forecasted in areas. But it will, we will still have to see what, what is going to be possible. Um, still, they, those plants are not yet constructed. But hopefully there will be areas which can take advantage of a favourable renewables like solar, uh, wind and hydropower. Well, the first big project that has been announced uh, is the project connecting Saudi Arabia, Rotterdam. So it's uh, the NAOM project in the northwest of uh, Saudi Arabia, um, together with some members of, of our association. Um, and uh, maybe, uh, Anna, you, you can describe a little bit what, what you are expecting there, because here uh, we expect a considerable amount of uh, green hydrogen coming to Rotterdam and then being transported via pipeline, by the way, uh, to. Uh, the place I'm born, by the way, to Duisburg, where um, ThyssenKrupp uh, would be uh, the big customer. Can, can you describe your expectations here uh, and why it is that this region of the world, MENA region in this case, um, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, is uh, selected, has been selected uh, as uh, the, the place where the hydrogen will be produced? Yes, for sure. Well, uh, it's not so much a matter of selection, but um, obviously in this um, in this region there are great conditions for for renewable energy. 
So, and, and there are great ambitions and a um, proactive uh, government and co companies who have joined and created this impressive uh, NEON project. So, um, uh, and we are in contact with them um, to indeed uh, connect them to, to, to clients in the, in the hinterland. Um, although the hinterland as a word I shouldn't use, I think. <laughs> Excuse my German, but um, um, yeah. So um, uh, we, are, we are very eager to work with them. And, I, and we do see, as we see with many uh, international import projects, that um, there's a great awareness for all parties that they need to, that they want to create value more than just setting up a economic uh, uh, economic incentive. And they, of course, that's very important. But also there is a um, possibility to to contribute to the sustainable development goals as are all parties there. So that is uh, great to work with and it's very much in line with our own principles of how we want to do business. I think the figure there is 4 million tons uh, of hydrogen to be produced. So it's quite a big chunk of the 20 million tons and we can see already yeah. that it will be easier um, to produce hydrogen in the MENA region or even in other regions uh, in the world, like um, we had elections uh, in Australia last week with a new government. The new government um, has already clearly said it will turn into hydrogen projects. Seems quite far-fetched indeed from a distance, but the, the, the price of hydrogen there, the production price is very, very low. So indeed, it makes sense to go there. What about water? Um, what about the water issue? Because in order to do electrolysis, we need, of course, water. Um, maybe Anna has a point there, but Valeria, will we see water pipelines in the deserts uh, bringing seawater from, uh, I don't know, from Mediterranean or Atlantic to uh, Mauritanian deserts and uh, be desalinated there at the spot? Is that an option? Uh, I don't want to say something that is perceived as a banality or not answering seriously to the question, but uh, pipelines can transport <laughs> different types of <laughs> things that uh, happen to be in the periodic table of the elements. So again, um, it, it's up to our engineers and it's up to the local conditions, the local circumstances, the economics, the availability of resources. Uh, the desalinization, of course, water, now jokes apart, remains a serious topic uh, whenever we talk about this and not just this, uh, because we will be confronted now with other uh, topics, uh, food scarcity, etc. So um, let, let's say that, of course, uh, as infrastructure operators, the spectrum of the solutions is broad. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, of course, it depends on the needs, on the requirements and on the local circumstances. It sounds like a banality, but in the end, this is what people ask us now. Huh? So this is what people want to know. How do you get water into the desert? And, um, or where do you want to do this electrolysis? Uh, do you want to do it only on seaside? So then you need cable from the PV, from the PV installation uh, to seaside. So these are banalities but also practical things we need to discuss now that before 24th of uh, 24th of march when the first draft of repower eu was was presented were a little bit far in the future but now we need to do it we have eight years um if i if i might recall um the capacity we need in electrolyzers mm. uh, at the moment globally we have three three gigawatt maximum uh, and we would need to produce 20 million tons, 300 of gigawatts. And that seems quite a big, uh, you know, up scale in, in quite a short time. Let's use the remaining um, minutes that we have for our panel for the question of uh, hampering or helping uh, the industry here. Because, I mean, the task is, is gigantic. Again, we thank the Commission for this uh, door opening. At the same time, uh, Bernd at the beginning referred to the definition of, of renewable hydrogen 
and I would like to reiterate and come back to it. Yes, there were two delegated acts with uh, Repower EU that have been published. One on the so-called additionality and the other one on um, how to account uh, the greenhouse gas emission uh, from hydrogen projects. Um, and whereas the GHG issue is, I would say, balanced and, and, and very favorable uh, to a fast upscale, especially the additionality delegated act has been expected with some, yeah, um, some mixed feelings, to be honest. And um, I, I would like a little bit your, your comments, and I would like to start with Eva. Um, I have seen uh, comments in the European press where um, some industries have have really, really criticized what is on the table, have said, well, this is putting weight on our shoulders, uh, although we should run now. Uh, at the same time, uh, the NGOs criticized that there is grandfathering. Grandfathering means that the Delegated Act allows for companies investing until 27, allows that they are exempted. So they, they don't need to prove additionality. There is still some ambiguity in reading the text. However, NGOs criticize it. So where are we now? So how, what, what, what's your um, reaction, Eva, um, to this um, yeah, whole package? We power EU, good, Delegated Act, bad? Question mark. <laughs> I don't think you can, it's, it's, it's black and white. So for, for the additionality, the discussion on the additionality led that our biggest uh, project has been stopped now for several months because nobody could take any investment decision. And this is what I'm afraid of that now, I don't really see that it will be, so the grandfathering helps, of course, because it pushes then now the first investments. But the question is, um, is, it, is this enough? Because uh, 27 is soon, we're already in 22, which means that big projects, anything who's now planning bigger projects will be then out of the scope. So I'm afraid that it's too complicated, that there are too many rules in there uh, that are hindering. And it seems like still that renew, there are two different worlds of renewables. So there are gaseous renewables and there's electricity renewables. And it's done in a way which makes sure that it's bloody complicated to do uh, green hydrogen. And instead of really pushing for it, that we have more um, construction of electrolyzers and that we have more of them, it will just go to other countries. When you look at the investors, there are so many investors out there, uh, Tree Energy Solutions, which is building Wilhelmshaven. I think they all want to invest. And if they're not able to invest in Europe, then they just go somewhere else because they have the money they are willing to invest in hydrogen, then they go to the UK or they go to the US. So I think this is really a pity uh, that we are the ones who will then not be able to do this. I don't have, I haven't analyzed what it means for the local level, what, how we can really do it. We wanted to have at least those plants which are already existing also put them um, up to producing a, a hydrogen. The question is, is this possible? How long is this possible? What does it mean? So I don't see this as an accelerator. So it's just for me the opposite of what we want with Repower U uh, to accelerate things because somehow you have to fill those pipes with hydrogen and the hydrogen has to come from somewhere. And um, I have my problems with this. Valeria was nodding uh, and I think uh, she, uh, she knows this uh, development already possibly from the PV industry where we also as Europeans uh, had big plans uh, some 10 years ago, and now the whole, the whole, main, main, you know, the whole industry nearly is in China. Valeria, you, why, why did you not? The, the big dependency nobody was worried about. Uh, no, it's true that a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of attention has been paid in this communication to the speeding up of the permitting procedures uh, to a point where the Commission has uh, dedicated one of the few uh, legislative initiatives in the package to uh, the, 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 the review of uh, RED2. Um, and, and there again, uh, sometimes a time lag of three years uh, is perceived like a, a big uh, uh, time horizon, but uh, for investments of that kind, uh, it's incredibly short. Uh, so it feels like a big concession. It feels like a big relaxation um, for investment like that. It means yesterday. So even uh, considering 2030 uh, could be an option, mm, uh, 
But there again, uh, we have to keep in mind that this is a business that needs to be started, that need to be upscaled. Uh, if we look overall, the consequences of this delegated act in the way it was presented was to double, uh, to some extent, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the amount of gigawatt needed to produce uh, one ton of hydrogen. Mm. So uh, if this is the, the result, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we want to kickstart uh, this in Europe? Uh, assuming then, of course, that for the European Union, this should be the standard also for uh, hydrogen inter countries, mm, or a question mark on this, uh, and at which conditions. But there again, uh, it goes hand in hand uh, for me also, and this calls for deeper reflections on the functioning of power markets today, on how renewables are distributed, uh, on uh, at which path they're developed, uh, and so on. So it, it, sh it should not be a standalone discussion here. You interestingly mentioned 2030. I would have asked you that, if, uh, but you mentioned it yourself, because the gas, uh, the decarbonized gases and hydrogen package from back from December last year, which is basically discussed at the moment, talks about the start of a hydrogen market in 2030. So it, it's logical to connect this and not to start in 27 uh, with, uh, or to have grandfathering until 27, but until 2030, just, just saying, but thanks God, there is a possibility to take part in the public consultation and the member states, especially, and the members of parliament are invited to come back. I think the, the commission still has the chance to adapt this. Um, my last questions go to Wiebeke and uh, to Anne. Um, and um, thanks for coming back with a, with a clear answer. What would investors uh, need as signals to now invest into hydrogen? Is Repower EU enough? Uh, do you think they, they will be invited? What can we do for investments uh, so that Yara can profit or the port of Rotterdam can flourish even more? Wiebeke. I th think one of the big things is also to see that there is a clear ask also out there for demand. I think it's, it's we have we have now a lot of, of incentives and policies in place for, for production, but still there needs to be also created a higher incentive for demand for hydro, green hydrogen and green ammonia. Excellent. So carbon contracts for different might, might be an interesting Mm, scheme if it would be paid to you guys because you are the demanders you are uh, the guys who buy them that hydrogen uh, to help you in the transition period Anna what's your wish uh, for uh, more investments into hydrogen in the, the Rotterdam port yeah demand and innovation is uh, number one and two and uh, the others are already mentioned so certification uh, contracts for difference um, Clear targets for renewables. We have now the the, the red, the uh, revised red. So and obviously uh, the Europe on the European level, the infra pipelines and uh, and terminals, and perhaps also good to mention uh, on on that topic. Uh, I think uh, financial support is needed to to be able to store all those. Um, uh, different types of uh, uh, hydrogen. Um, that would be uh, that would be my wish list. It's it's not a short list, but um, there you go. Many thanks. It's an epochal tipping point that we are living. Normally, I would say, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I can say, ladies. Thanks very much for uh, your contributions and for your insights. Very helpful, uh, also for our work, and I hope also for the participants of this hydrogen talk. Next one will be uh, 1st of July on Africa, on our co cooperation with the African Hydrogen Partnership. This is all for today. Thanks very much for your participation. Bye-bye.